Peninsula to Ukraine. Joining us now to weigh in on all this, uh, all the developments tonight, is CNN senior political analyst and senior editor of The Atlantic, Ron Brownstein, New York Times op-ed columnist Charles Blow, chief political correspondent Dana Bash, also Trump supporter and contributor to The Hill, Kaylee McEnany, Democratic strategist Paul Begala, and Penny Nance, Trump supporter, CEO and president of Concerned Women for America, and author of Feisty and Feminine, A Rallying Cry for Conservative uh, Women. Uh, Dana, I mean, you have three ge- geopolitical hotspots, Iran, uh, Israel, uh, and now Russia. W- what do you make of all the movements today. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really hard to keep up. Uh, and I think in some ways that's kind of the point. What I find most fascinating is what you just reported, that Nikki Haley, the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, went before this body and said things about Russia in Crimea that the president, her boss, differed with kind of in a 180 degree way during the campaign. I mean, he has been very opened the idea of not being tough on Russia, even opened the idea, uh, at least on one occasion during the campaign, of just kind of leaving the Crimea situation alone. That is not what we heard from the, uh, his ambassador to the UN today. I just talked to somebody who was uh, familiar with the drafting of her remarks, who said that the White House was well aware of what she was going to do, but also well aware of her position on this, which is pretty hawkish, Mm. which is more in line, frankly, with the Republican Party's credo and philosophy, which is to be tough on Russia. Uh, She made that clear in her confirmation hearings. The White House and the president heard that, and she's going to continue to do that. You know, Paul, just last night in the broadcast, you were critical of the the administration for not uh, speaking out about uh, the situation in Ukraine. Does this give you uh, confidence? Yeah, well, it gives me hope. Uh, Ambassador Haley said exactly what Democrats and Republicans, I think Americans, want to hear. And, and I think it's terrific how she stood up for our values and American values. But, you know, uh, John Mitchell back in the Nixon administration used to say, watch what we do, not what we say. There's reports now that what the Trump administration is, is going to do or is doing is easing sanctions on the FSB, which is the KGB, the successor interest of the KGB. So we're talking tough, which is better than we were doing yesterday. So I'm, I'm very impressed with Ambassador Haley. But if we're easing sanctions on Russia, when, when their separatists have now killed 19 people in eastern Ukraine yesterday alone, we have 20,000 people in Ukraine in this region who are without water or heat. It's freezing cold, a humanitarian crisis, all caused by the Russians. And we're talking about easing sanctions. Yeah, on but, but a lot of the reporting I saw on the, the allegedly easing sanctions against the FSB this morning was pointing out that it, it's actually not quite what some right. of the headlines made it out to be. Right. It should be reported out more carefully, but there should be no talk of easing in any way. We should be toughening the sanctions, not easing them. Kaylin? But in, and you're right. Even Jake Sullivan, who's worked you know in the foreign policy realm for Biden and Obama and Hillary Clinton, came out and said this was, in fact, a technical easing of sanctions. Right. Michael Weiss, who we've had on this broadcast. Sure, I- of course. Um, but I do think what was interesting about Nikki Haley's statement is that Trump has indicated that he is willing to defer to the people he has appointed in some capacity. We know with General Mattis, he has said whatever he says on enhanced interrogation methods, that's going to stand. I'm going to defer to him. So my question is, is this kind of a deference saying, look, Nikki Haley is who I appointed for this position. I'm going to defer to her in this regard. We didn't see President Trump come out and rebuff anything he said. This is someone who is his employee. He didn't rebuff her, as we've seen him do on on other, other occasions. So to me, it says deference to the people who I've appointed. You're absolutely right. And as I said, I was told that the White House was well aware of what she was going to do. The question is, where does that deference end? I mean, is he going to completely defer on on issues that he really seemed to disagree with before and continue to do that and have that become his policy? Or will the policy be contradictory and confused, which will confuse our allies and our foes? And And historically, the U.N. ambassador is not the official who's making policy on Russia, right? I mean, they're not you're not deferring to the real policymaker there. Look, I look, I think, you know, in all in all of the all of the examples you're talking about, uh, it is reality. You know, this is it is why governing is harder than campaigning. It is it is easy to draw bright lines and usually to say the previous administration is not being tough enough on whatever the problem is. Uh, And then when you get in office, you know, you face with a different set of. Uh, of concerns, and I think it was, I thought the uh, Elise's point about the way in which President Trump may be giving Benjamin not Netanyahu some sure. more room 
uh, is important, but it's also true that there was an inherent contradiction in the way he talked about Israel during the campaign, because on the one hand, he talked about standing more shoulder to shoulder with Netanyahu, and on the other hand, he talked about making, being the guy who could finally make the deal, and how much that appealed to him as a deal maker. If you're standing shoulder to shoulder to the extent he's implied, it's very hard to be the honest broker and make the deal, and I think you see some of those pressures playing out today in this kind of slight yeah. repositioning. Yeah, I mean, Penny, a lot of Trump's uh, conservative supporters, you know, uh, obviously like his uh, strong alliance with Israel. I mean, right. uh, just as Obama supporters liked his, where they saw was his yes, strong alliance. My, my guess is a lot of evangelicals watching tonight took a deep breath when you said that mm. because, um, as you know, he was elected by 86% of sure. evangelicals, and uh, we are strong supporters of the nation of Israel, and uh, would and recognize Judea and Samaria, the the areas that people call the disputed territory as the uh, historic home to Israel. The, 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 the and, notion, though, that, as Elise was reporting, of him giving cover to, to Netanyahu, I think is an interesting one. And very much a possibility. Of course, we know the prime minister is going to be coming very soon. I know, in fact, evangelicals just met with um, uh, with uh, with the ambassador to from Israel to the United States and the future ambassador to Israel um, and, uh, and are getting to know him. And I think that's going to be a very close relationship between evangelicals and, again, to, with uh, Israeli foreign policy. But again, we feel very strongly that it, the land belongs to Israel and that, that, that uh, the U.S. government needs to stand in lockstep with Israel on that point. Charles, what do well, you see? I, I see just a bigger, I, I look at it a bigger uh, picture, which is, you know, this is where bluster meets actual uh, you know, the, the situation on the ground, all of these, th these three situations are real strong, smart strategists uh, who've been on in the political arena and on the world stage for, in some cases, decades. Uh, and they're going to push the boundaries to see where the edges are. And, you know, Trump, people like to talk about Trump as the first citizen president of the United States. That is true. But, but there's a negative to that, which is that uh, these people are really strong and, you know, big personalities, know exactly what they want, know which buttons to push, are going to push you until you bend or break. And that is what is going to happen with Donald Trump, even among the people who he counts as friends. That is how political leaders on the world stage operate. There are no absolute friendships on the world stage. Mm. People push until they can see where they can no longer push anymore, and then they, they draw the line and say, this is where our boundary is. Mm. No permanent allies, only permanent interests. Yeah. Uh, we're going to continue this after a very short break.